Tonight, policing the gangs. I thought I'd seen gang violence, but what I saw just took it to a whole new level. A special type of policing for a special type of criminal. They would be the most evil people I have ever dealt with. Bringing law to the lawless. They are significantly donkey deep in the distribution of methamphetamine. The bikies, the brawlers, and the big business of crime. Big and noisy. With middle finger firmly raised at society, they specialize in crime, violence, and intimidation, existing only to make money and raise hell. They see themselves as one percenters, those people that are against the rest of society. They actually don't care who they're selling to, what age they are, what gender they are, what part of society they're from. They are interested in making the mighty buck at the end of the day. Their organisations are there for the sole purpose of crime. In the 90s, Timaru was a town gripped by terror. The police struggling to control runaway gang violence. Shootings, violence and firebombings were becoming an almost daily occurrence. The Road Knights and the Devil's Henchmen were gangs that had the whole community living in fear. In the three months, the end of 91, there were numerous gang attacks. There were two homicides that had links back to the gangs. There were a number of beatings, home invasions. It's incredible the amount of crime you could get into three months in a small place like Timaru. And it was clear that things were out of control. When Bill Gregory was transferred to Timaru, he found a town in terror and a police force struggling to control the lawlessness. Why have the cops not acted on it? To get them out of town, no one wants them here. We have policed them to the best of our ability. The police had for years put little band-aid solutions in place, you know, two, three week operation, put a bit of pressure on the gangs. Things had quieted down a little bit, but as soon as the police turned their back again, the tension would ratchet up again and the violence would start. A stolen vehicle pulled up opposite the opposition's hotel and the back window was wound down like you see on the movies. I've worked in Lower Hutt and uh, the Wire Rapper and Wellington, and I thought I'd seen um, gang violence at a pretty high level, but what I saw in Timaru just took it to a whole new level. Timaru people have put up with their feuding bikies for years now, but last month's shooting of a gang member and subsequent arson attacks finally stirred them into action. I got the job of putting together a, a plan as to what we were going to do about the situation, and basically what it was was a hol holistic plan to actually cripple the gangs, and also it wouldn't be a two-week, three-week band-aid job. Um, this operation was intended to go for months and months and months, uh, and at the end of it, it would then shape the way in which we police Timaru from then on. I started by having a meeting with both gangs. I went to their headquarters, and basically I explained to them what we were intending to do. So we started policing them, and policing them hard. Police started by searching gang pads with a fine-tooth comb, making sure buildings were up to code, health department regulations were met, and all property ownership could be proved. Yours? Or mine? One of the things we targeted was their sale of liquor because of the way in which they were using the debts that acquired through sale of liquor, uh, and the mana they were gained in the town by having a pretty attractive social spot at their headquarters. What we did is we took out everything in the place that was connected with the sale or supply of alcohol. You're paying for that? We took their furniture, we took their bar, we took their chillers, we took their electric lights, um, we, we, you name it, we took it. And so they would end up with a pretty bare room and a hole in the corner where the bar used to be. And, uh, and then apply to the court for the destruction of that equipment. And so it was holistic policing like that. 
Getting help from the wider community was also a key part of Bill's big plan. We set up a hotline, and whereas before we weren't getting much information from the public, it started as a trickle, and as we were able to get results and we advertised those results in the paper, etc., that got bigger and bigger and bigger until it turned into a torrent of information. And that information from the public is the lifeblood of the police. Without it, we can't operate properly. As the police influence in the town rose, the gang influence went down, people felt a lot better, and certainly their influence on what happened in the town was, was cut to pieces. The gangs have never, ever gone back to where they were, which is pretty good. Um, you know, 20 years later, they've never gone back to what they were. Bill Gregory's plan for policing the biker gangs worked in Timaru, but could it deal to a rogue gang in the lower North Island? The Nomads, as a gang, were an offshoot of the Black Power. And on the Nomads patch, they have the number 77, which indicates in 1977 was the first split from Black Power. And the story goes that Dennis Hines and some other senior Black Power members had a disagreement with Ray Harris, who was the president and were essentially based in Macedon in the Wairapa. And another uh, offshoot in the Horofanua centred around Dennis Hines within Levin and Foxton. When the nomads hit Woodville's Mountain Rock Festival, it wasn't peace and love they were packing, but violence and intimidation. Fans will be literally rocking around the clock tonight. The bands will be playing until the festival ends about four o'clock tomorrow morning. Early on the Sunday morning, uh, a group of nomads came across a rival motorcycle gang member. They assaulted him and essentially he got strung up over a, a small wire fence. You think we're tough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. You still think we're tough? Hey, hey. See how tough you are when we cut your lips off? Yeah. Chicken shit. Please. Dennis Hines came along and using a butcher's knife, ah. slashed the throat and the face of this other man. No one would come forward to challenge the nomad's hard man. Not even the victim brave enough to speak up alone. Police needed a new strategy to defeat the gang. The Nomads gang had been running amok for years. Assaults and scare tactics had become the norm. Police say the gang has virtually held the horror Whenua to ransom over the last two years. Nomad prospects linked to the killing of Foxton doctor Howard Tepit. And police claim gang members were also responsible for shots fired at this house in Foxton recently. Townsfolk were living in fear. I don't want to come in, please. I'd rather not say. But if police could convince scared individuals to stand united against the gang, they knew they'd have a chance of winning the battle. Another constable and myself identified all the cars that the nomads were driving. Many of them weren't registered to nomad members. So we went and visited the registered owners and said, you know, why are the nomads driving your car? And we began to hear stories of, well, they came round, they beat me up and they took it. The nomads referred to it semi-politely was they were taxing people, but essentially they were committing aggravated robberies. We managed to gather together a number of the victims who still hadn't reported to the police formally what had happened. And we, we gathered all of them together and we said, look, the, the power of all of you is much stronger than any of you individually. Uh, Foxton particularly, small community, if if they made complaints to us, we would then take every complaint and then make arrests on a particular day. The message back to the nomads would be that they are not untouchable and a large number of the community is standing up against them. As the nomads began appearing in court, the surrounding publicity flushed out a surprise witness to the vicious attack at Mountain Rock. We had a man who walked into a police station to say that he was at the concert. He was Joe Citizen, no gang connections. Uh, and while in a portaloo on the Sunday morning, he looked out and saw the assault and saw Dennis Hines slash the man's throat. Also during the, the trial phase, we received a phone call 
uh, from a man who lived in the Hawke's Bay. But he said, I've got a photograph that you might be quite interested in. And on the Sunday morning, he'd taken a photo of the stage, but in the foreground was a lineup of nomads wearing their patches. And metres in front of them was our victim and his associate walking towards them. And it was a snapshot in time of seconds before the assault took place, but it put all of our key people exactly where we knew they were and corroborated much of what was being given in court, but it was the photographic evidence of it. There was one super trial with a large number of accused charged with a number of offences. Charges relating to robberies in Levin through to the aggravated assault at Mountain Rock saw the gang's ranks decimated. Out of 46 offences that we laid, uh, 43 convictions, and nomads pretty much heading straight to jail. The nomads never returned to their former strength. But a gang's strength wasn't necessarily measured by the number of patched members. Pound for pound, the Fourth Reich gang from the South Island were considered among the most evil criminals around. <coughs> Detectives, called to a fight at a Christchurch house, arrived to find a man bleeding heavily on the driveway. Hey. Hey, can you hear me? <coughs> OK, mate, hey, just put... <coughs> Just put your head down and relax, man. The ambulance is on its way, all right? She can see how far away that ambulance. He had deep cuts in his head. He looked like a, been a skinny, he looked like a boiled egg, which had been half cracked open quite literally, and the blood running out of him all across his face. The stab wound to the ribs and the sucking chest wound and a severed finger. He got the impression very early on that there was something serious and, um, and prolonged had happened. The inquiry dragged Derek Shaw far closer than he'd have liked to the extreme world of white power gangs. Fourth Reich formed in Paparoa Prison in the mid-late 90s, a group of like-minded men who I still can't figure out what their philosophy is or, or that, but they took on a very neo-Nazi extremist philosophy and they would be the most evil people I have ever dealt with. They oozed hatred. Uh, and they didn't really discriminate. It wasn't just myself and the police they hated. They seemed to hate everybody and everything. The wounded man was rushed to hospital while Derek examined the scene. In the house, there was a considerable amount of blood. There'd obviously been a fierce assault taking place. There was blood on the couch. There was shoe prints through the kitchen. And on a TV, there was blood. Despite his wounds, the man refused to tell Derek what had happened. Later found out his name was Nathan, and he was part or an associate of the Fourth Reich skinhead gang. But we couldn't advance the inquiry um, much at all because Nathan just wasn't, wasn't keen to, to, to speak to us. So that's when we sort of reassessed the situation. He was in hospital. He'd, um, he was going to be there for a couple of days. So went to the hospital and just tried to strike up a rapport with him. When he was discharged, managed to spend time with him. I wanted his shoes to assist us with our examination. And although he could supply other clothing, he couldn't supply another pair of shoes. So we agreed to swap shoes. So he got a pair of my smelly old running shoes and, and I got his. OK, I just need you to sign the statement just to verify what you've said. And he just spent a long time just looking at the statement that he had contributed to, which he wouldn't sign. He had been sent from Nelson with some cannabis oil to deliver it to prisoners in Christchurch, and that he was the courier for that. But no, no unknown to the Fourth Right Gang hierarchy, um, Nathan was a, um, a drug addict. So it's we were like leaving the rat in charge of the cheese, really. When he arrived here, um, they were down quite a few cannabis um, oil capsules, and so they, they wanted retribution. He said, this statement is true. He said, but at the moment I sign it, I'm signing my death warrant. But he did finally sign the, the statement, which was a quite an extensive statement, and named the offenders and, and named what happened. And he recounted to us how he'd been walking in Stanmore Road in Christchurch with his girlfriend when uh, Ivan Gugic and Greg Dunnell pulled up in a Cortina. They told him to get in, and they then took him to Essex Street in Christchurch, where 
He walked into the lens and he was blindsided from behind by either Gugut or Dunham. And then there was a systematic attack on him. He was just beaten. He believes at first they tried to break his jaw to send the message, but they couldn't. So after kicking him and stabbing him, they then inserted a knife above his ear, right to the bone, and then pulled it across the top of his head. Um, by this stage, the fight had totally gone out of him, and they then dragged him to the TV where they told him to nominate a finger. Um, they then spent some time using a serrated bread knife, severing his finger. Couldn't cut it off completely, so they worked it backwards and forward so it snapped off. Nathan then went next door to get help, um, and it was at that point that, that we got called. And we found him on the driveway. <laughs> there was a, an impression found on the top of Nathan's shoes, of Gugic's shoes, where he had stomped uh, on uh, Nathan when he was on the ground and uh, transferred blood from the bottom of his shoes onto the top of Nathan's shoes. So it's very similar to a fingerprint. The more characteristics, the stronger the likelihood of the match. Dunnell was uh, located here in Christchurch and I arrested him, but he said nothing. He staunch, followed their code, and gave us no cooperation at all. Uh, but then within a few days, um, the Nelson CIB had located uh, Gugic, and uh, some of our staff went there and spoke to him, and again, said nothing. But they were remanded in custody, uh, and, and we went to trial um, later that year, when Nathan came and gave evidence, and gave outstandingly honest evidence but it was supported by really good forensic work by the ESR. Forensic evidence from Nathan's clothes and the bloody shoe prints tied Gugic and Dunnell to the gory crime scene. The jury believed Nathan, and the vicious thugs were sent to jail for eight years for wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Out of, say, the 15 full members that there ever were, six of them are now doing life sentences for murder, and one has committed two murders. Um, so, 40% of the gang are convicted murderers. Getting up close and personal with such remorseless criminals is a risky business. But the only way to investigate some organised crime is for detectives to enter the gangs in a sanctum. A gang lifestyle doesn't come cheap, but an honest day's work, that's not on the cards. Gangs will always find an easy way to make money. It's either violence or drugs, you know, and usually the two are quite linked. They have other areas, prostitution and um, dishonesty, that sort of thing, but, but drugs is the big one. The challenge for detectives investigating gangs is to get evidence that stands up in court, and that can mean venturing into the heart of gangland. As a young constable, Catherine McEvity was dressed in civvies and sent to buy dope. I didn't look like a policewoman back in those early days, so, you know, a bit of spiky hair, a bit of a studded belt would uh, cut it with the general population, so I used to be used to buy drugs from tinny houses. One of the ones I remember really clearly was a guy selling to school kids, and so I went in dressed as a younger person. What? I went in three times, and on the third time, he took me right through to the back of the property, and you were led through a series of doors, and then the steel door clunked behind you. And I was thinking, oh, oh here we go. And he hit me up and said, you're a, you're a cop. I was going, no, no, not me, thinking, shit, how does he know, does he know? I was going, no, mate, no, not me, you know, I'm not a cop. I'm, look, I just want to buy some drugs, and, you know, as you do, selling it as quickly as you can. And he went out. And he left me locked in this room, and I was thinking, I was looking around, thinking, how do I get out of here? I know there's a steel door at the front, the windows were all barred, there was no way out, so you had to stand your ground. You are on your own, because you've got to use your mouth to talk your way out of whatever you get caught in. And he came back in 10 minutes later, left me to sweat for 10 minutes, and uh, handed me a bag of drugs. Choice. Friends waiting in the car. Don't want to stay and party, girl. Cheerily made my way out, thinking, thank God I'm out of here. And when that door slammed and I got round the corner, I just that relief that he didn't pop me that time, and uh, we made sure we got him. Gang tactics change over time. 
buyers don't get invited into the dealer's house anymore. Instead, there'll be an anonymous exchange, money for drugs. Well, they had what they call a dealing alley. It was a, a very defined route you, you could go in. And they had a dealing window, you know, some classic signs on the window, which they were telling customers the price. You know, it was, it was advertising Mungle Mob style. You, you handed over your money, you got your product, and you're out the door. Ross Tarafiti targeted the drug business being run out of the Christchurch Mongrel Mobs headquarters. Detectives bugging phones and listening to the gang's dealings. The Mongrel Mob have various different slangs. Uh, they, they call each other dogs and they even get down to the stage where they start barking at each other and uh, things like that. It's all meant to be shown as a mark of respect but um, it's quite humorous for us listening at the other end. They spoke in codes. Um, when they wanted the extra product to come down to the pad house, they tried to make out they were doing some renovations there. But uh, when, you, when you hear, send me 10 or 20 nails every time, you know, not many people go and buy that amount of nails at, at a small amount. So it wasn't too hard to work out what they were doing. The Christchurch detectives had heard and seen enough. They executed 38 warrants and arrested more than 40 mobsters. All patched members were convicted, the gang pad bulldozed, and the Christchurch chapter of the mob wiped from existence. There was a noticeable downturn in criminal activity as a result of removing these people from their community. But selling cannabis isn't the sole domain of the mob. Up in Otahuhu, the Black Power were creaming it, running Auckland's biggest tinny house. Head office was known as the Marae. Enough tinnies of cannabis were sold here to annually make this the $6 million mansion. On a good day, up to $17,000 worth of drugs were being sold from that address. Um, average days, we were told, uh, was between twelve dollars and $14,000 per day and uh, at times it was just so busy, the whole street was blocked off with the numbers of vehicles that were coming and going. Operation Soprano, as it was known, went after the gang bosses to shut down the pad once and for all. It was a family-run organisation. Abraham Fariwaka Sr. was the president. His brother was the sergeant-at-arms or the treasurer. His son was involved a great deal with the chapter, and uh, a lot of the other associates that were locked up as part of the operation were, were nephews or, or sons of, of uh, Abe and his brother. But the investigation showed that selling drugs was not the extent of the gang's crime, their home movies becoming evidence at the trial. There was also a lot of peripheral offending in relation to violence, possession of firearms, attempting to pervert the course of justice, trying to get witnesses to change statements, and also manufacturing methamphetamine. Footage of Abe Jr. assaulting his partner really showed the gang's true colours. The home movie ensured Abe Jr.'s day in court for the abuse. Guilty. The Farewakas all went to prison. Gang boss Abe Sr. getting eight years. Detectives won that battle but the rules of the game keep changing. After years of knowing who local gang members were and understanding their tribal systems, at the end of the 90s, a worrying new trend emerged. Detectives were disturbed to see rival gangs beginning to work side by side. When I first started the CIB and uh, had dealings with the gangs, uh, it was a pretty loose collection of individuals who were um, really drawn together by their love of uh, raising hell and committing crime and living the, the easy life. The ethnic gangs tended to be involved in street level offending um, and it wasn't until we started seeing collaborations between the ethnic gangs and the outlaw motorcycle gangs that we really started seeing uh, and perhaps being concerned about the level of uh, organised crime that they might now be and had the opportunity to, to drive. We've certainly seen in, uh, in the last 15 years or so, um, gangs working together on a business level. There's two levels. There's the inter-gang level where you throw stones at each other um, out in the street there and be staunch, but there's the other side is business. And when it comes to business, business is supreme. Since we've got into the more into the methamphetamine, um, 
there's, there's been more a, a cooperative sort of, you know, this is business type approach. We witnessed in some of our operations the coming together of Highway 61, Road Night uh, members, um, Mungrel Mob members, uh, all talking about who they could bring to the table. So they might, one might have a cook, uh, one might be able to get precursors, so that's the, the you know, the, the, um, the powders that you need to make the drugs, like contact NT. Someone might be able to access glassware through someone, um, and w we sat and watched this and listened to this happening. So they'd say, right, I can bring this person, I can bring this person. And so you saw that breakdown of the barriers around the gangs because this was about business and making money. The Mungra Mall had, had um, soldiers on the street. They had uh, all the contacts. They knew what, who the users were. They knew what their market was. They knew who lived where in the suburbs where their gang operated, whereas the white motorcycle gangs, they didn't have that sort of information. So the amalgamations allowed them to, to have a far wider distribution of their drugs. And now they are significantly donkey deep in the distribution of methamphetamine. The Hells Angels, for instance, were as renowned for the corporate attire that many of their members wore as for the patches that they wore on their back two-piece or three-piece suits with simply the emblem as a marker on one of the lapels for the Hells Angels. We've had uh, the international president of the, of the Hells Angels was a New Zealander. The first ever chapter of the Hells Angels set up outside of the United States was set up in Auckland, New Zealand. We have a, a long history of involvement with that gang and its international network of criminals. Officers gave a presentation showing gangs like the Hells Angels, with 130 chapters worldwide, are seeking to control all major New Zealand motorcycle gangs. Police say in February, the Hells Angels met several times with other gangs in Christchurch, like the Road Knights. The Hells Angels were by far, um, far more sophisticated than our ethnic gangs in terms of their connection offshore, their ability to evade uh, detection and, and work under the radar. An FBI guy from the States says that Hells Angels in the United States are very heavily into drugs with Australian Hells Angels as well. Have you heard those things before? Sure, yeah, yeah, we, we hear them from time to time. But, uh, I mean, it's easy to allege things like that, isn't it? I mean, once it's alleged and it's publicised, then the people get hold of it, and then, uh, yeah, that's where your rumours start, right there. But there's been nothing proved at all. They have the capability and the ability to distribute and to import drugs, whether in collaboration with groups like Asian organised crime, uh, whether it's being financed by Russian organised crime, it doesn't matter. The Hells Angels started to go around the countryside and said, you know, we've got a white powder distribution network. We can make you quite wealthy if you like to join our network and distribute drugs on our behalf. But if you do that, you've got to reduce your, your other criminal offending. They were quite adamant that if you wanted to become a trafficker on behalf of the Hells Angels, then you had to reduce your interaction with the police. So we actually had gang members who were taking off their patches and behaving themselves, and so a lot of people thought they were reformed, whereas those of us in the, in the crime scene knew that they were simply uh, telling us that they were now part of the organised motorcycle gang distribution networks. We're a motorcycle club, we're not a gang. You don't like the word gang? Not really, no. It doesn't mm. accurately describe us. Because then you're starting putting us in with uh, like street kids and street gangs and things like that, and uh, we're a motorcycle club, a brotherhood. For years, police have been hitting the gangs hard, but lopping off the head of the snake just meant another head grew somewhere else, or they took off their patches altogether. Detectives were looking for a way to make changes in gang culture come from the inside, because some of the young soldiers on the streets weren't getting the message about keeping under the radar. A Whanganui Saturday night means rival gangsters out looking for trouble. When a carload of mongrel mobsters hurled abuse at black power rivals, they were sent packing. And from there, there was a bit of posturing between the two rival groups. And then later on, there's been another that's followed on and it's gradually got worse. Whanganui CIB boss Dave Kirby got the call late on a Saturday night that the local gangs were at it again. 
these cars have gone away and armed themselves with a firearm and come back for kind of like payback. Shoot them, boy. Shoot them, Nance. Boy, shoot that motherfucker. Yeah. Get him. They're right there, right there. Get bully tickets. And then things just escalated to the point that, yeah, we had the two-year-old shot. But it all started from, from um, just the shouting out of a mongrel mob slogan. Gang members aren't renowned for wanting to cooperate with the police. So we had these people that were horrified about what they'd just seen. Plus, they were angry. Obviously, a child of one of their own had been killed, um, and they wanted retribution as well. So we had to try and persuade them, let us deal with it, and then we dealt with appropriately with the courts. We were told sort of around 15 Black Power members hanging out at the front of the house, and the shot was fired through them and it had gone into the house and killed a two-year-old who was lying on the couch. We've got 15 Black Power members that are potential witnesses for us here as to who these people were in the cars that have driven past and who fired the shots. But then a breakthrough as witnesses from both sides opened up. Eventually, all those that were on that front lawn um, came and told us um, their version of what had gone on. Of the carload of mongrel mobsters involved, two of them agreed to give evidence themselves in exchange for protection from their fellow gangsters. One of the witnesses, it was probably one of the best lines, I think, and that was at the pre-hearing. The one witness, he was getting a fairly um, hard time, I suppose, quite a, quite a questioning from some of the defence lawyers. And um, his response was, you know, I'm just being a voice for the two-year-old. There were three convicted of trial for murder. The guilty verdicts were handed down to Hayden Wallace, the shooter, Carl Check, the organiser, and Ranji Forbes, the driver of the car in the drive-by shooting. Everyone we charged was convicted of some part of their involvement. So, yeah, no, I was absolutely stoked. Good job, good job. They were really pleased in, in the memory of Gia Tatua that we could achieve the result and the person that pulled the trigger and those involved be brought to justice. The mongrel mobsters giving evidence proved that even lifelong gang members have a conscience. The challenge for detectives is finding a way to reach the kind heart under the tough exterior. Rotorua Detective Sergeant Chris McLeod has had many dealings with the local gang. The filthy few are a motorbike gang, but uh, basically they're, they're drug dealers. They sell methamphetamine and cannabis. The head of the filthy few, James Wilson, was known by all as Little Willie. He was a tattooist by trade, as well as a drug dealer. He had a cross tattooed on his forehead, trying to emulate the cult killer Charles Manson. Some of his associates in the filthy feud didn't like the evilness that that portrayed and uh, softened it with a, uh, a swastika and then wrote forever filthy across his forehead as well. 32-year-old Tauranga woman Joanne van Dyven Bowden had fallen in with the gang. She'd started taking drugs and befriended little Willie. They struck up a uh, short uh, liaison um, and that was a, a sexual relationship at one stage, uh, but that ended very quickly. And then uh, she made friends with a, another member of the, the Filthy Few, um, a guy called Shades. Shades was the gang's sergeant at arms, a kingpin position, technically third in the gang hierarchy, but with responsibility for guns, ammunition, and keeping all of the gang's members, contacts, and customers in line. He would also organise if there was any justice to be dealt to other criminals that weren't paying their bills. Little Willie was very good friends with Shades, took exception to the fact that he had in effect been dumped by Joanne and uh, vowed that he was going to put a bullet into her at some stage. On a tranquil rural road just minutes from the centre of Tauranga, a violent murder. Police say the 32-year-old victim lived on the Welcome Bay property with a female flatmate. When the flatmate returned home at 3.30 this morning after a concert date in Auckland, she found the place ransacked. Police were called. The house had been trashed. Clothes and furniture had been dragged out and dumped down a bank. Under a mattress at the bottom of a gully was Joanne's body. 
We had some very good detectives working the scene itself where Joanne was found. Through meticulous examination of areas, there was grid searches done throughout about two acres of the property and on the veranda immediately outside Joanne's bedroom, a piece of phlegm was found on the decking that was secured by the scene detective and sent off to the ESR and it was found to be human material and had DNA qualities there. Investigators also found crucial clues in Joanne's room, around the deck and down into the gully where her body had been dumped. A trail of small pink threads from what looked like a hospital cast. And it was quite a distinctive pink colour. These shards of plaster cast proved to be very significant. Through our inquiries, it was revealed that there were only three people in Tauranga that had actually had this uh, pink um, plaster. Uh, casting, put on their um, their brakes, and two of them were, were little young girls. And then the third person, uh, ironically, was uh, was little Willie. Um, he had uh, broken his wrist on his motorbike uh, in an accident uh, some weeks beforehand, and um, because he looked somewhat fearsome, um, some of the hospital staff thought it uh, a bit funny that uh, they'd supply this tough gang member. Um, with a, uh, a pink cast. We were able to get Willie's DNA through a compulsion order, so it, it tied him into the scene. So he had some real questions to answer as to why his DNA was at the scene. Wilson's arrest comes only days after police voiced their frustration at the lack of help they were getting from some elements. Uh, there's now been a reversal in some quarters and um, people have begun to cooperate. That cooperation came from an unusual source. Little Willie's mate and longtime gang member, Shades. For Shades to even make a statement or to speak to the police was a huge uh, step for him. It was uh, right against his, his code as a gang member. He took the step because he was sufficiently concerned about Little Willie's behaviour and didn't think it was at all right that someone like Willie could expunge Joanne from the earth like he did. Shades put aside all his loyalty and the long history between him, Little Willie and the Filthy Few by signing up to give evidence. The, the signing up to give evidence was, uh, was only the first step really in uh, getting him into court and giving that evidence. He would run hot and cold as to whether he was going to give evidence over the months leading up to the trial. At one stage he'd run off to Takaha and hidden in someone's place up there and fortunately we had the ability to know where he was and we got him the night before he was due to give evidence. He was pretty unkempt because he'd been on the run from us because the trial had been running for a number of days. He was just in the, in the clothes then that he was standing in. I went and got him a, a toothbrush and some toothpaste at about half past ten at night and took it up to him in his uh, hotel room and. He said, see, that's what makes you guys different. He says, that's, that's why you, you treat us like human beings still, even though we're some of the scum of the earth, you, you still treat us like human beings. And that was just a little thing that, that tipped him over. He said that uh, he would always treasure. and a toothbrush, yeah. We had Justice Elias, who was uh, head of the High Court at the time, and Shades was, was Shades. He was uh, this long-haired, unkempt gang member. He just told it how it was. Uh, the defence did their best to try and tip him and rile him up, because he was a fiery character, and a classic line when the defence counsel, Louis Bidwar, had suggested to him that he was, in fact, the murderer, not Little Willie. Shades did the old, I'm not the one trying to be Charles fucking Manson. And he went like this with the crossbones above his, his forehead. He said, he's the one trying to be Charles fucking Manson. He's evil. And uh, oh, the, the jury just soaked it all up because it was just so genuine and so real uh, that, um, it went a long way to convincing the jury that uh, 
you know, we had the right man and uh, that Shades was, was a good person, deep down and, uh, and just doing the right thing. If detectives can find that person underneath the patch, big changes are possible. Tasha Penny's team arrested a gang member for assaults on his family and had his two children taken from him. He was pretty angry about that, as um, a lot of parents are when we take their children, but it was for a valid reason. And we had a very uh, powerful moment uh, last year when he agreed to come and talk to my team. Uh, we do training. Uh, regular training to make sure on, on all sorts of things, legislation, we get the crown and um, we, you know, things that we need to put in place. And uh, the officer who dealt with him asked if he would come and speak to the child protection team about what had happened to him. And he came in and he presented, quite a quite a big, quite a big man. And he told us about his life. And he said, when I was a young boy, all I knew about growing up was beatings, was violence. He told us of one occasion where he remembered that his father had beaten him so uh, harshly that he thought his leg had broken. And to this day, he carries a scar on his thigh. And he said, that's just all I knew. The beatings were every day, all day. Um, I, home wasn't a place. It, you couldn't have probably called it a home. It was a place where he went after school. And the stories that he told us were just very reminiscent and familiar of a lot of stories we hear of children in totally abusive environments. But his story is one of the most amazing and significant turnarounds that I've heard in 19 years. And he said to us, when you took my children from me, it made me realise and think about what was important to me. And he said, I love those boys. He said, they were my life. And he said, they're the only people in my whole life who'd given me unconditional love. He says, now I look back, I know my parents had let me down. I know other people had let me down. I'd gone into the gang and that's all I wanted. I, wa I wanted this whānau. I wanted this sense of belonging, this family. And he said, but I only had it from my children. And when you ripped them away from me, I realised I had to turn my life around. This... Man, he, man, did, did he walk it? He handed his patch back in. Now, that, that's a really big event for a gang member to hand their patch back in. And I remember staff saying to him, because you hear stories about you hand your patch back in and you don't just hand it in, there's things that come with that. But he, but he told us, actually, I handed it back in and I said, this is about my children. I need my children back. And he said, I took down the pictures of the marijuana and I took down all the gang paraphernalia and I cleaned my house out. He said, I just kept looking at the picture of my kids and knowing that I had to do it. He said, the first months were lonely. He said, I remember being upset, lonely, no friends. I had no friends. I'd walked away from the only family I'd known for the last two and a half decades. It was so powerful because every day we're arresting people for these offences. And I have no doubt that sometimes you can sit back and you can say, am I making the difference I really want to make? And you hear that one story and you know, I'm in it for the long term. I'm in it for the long haul because this is actually what it's all about.